Um, I'm Yasmin Kestmont, the person on the right in the picture, and I have with me uh, Lika on the left. And we've been working together now, I think, for a good two and a half, almost three years. So we've built some experience on uh, building a team and um, we've learned through uh, a lot of challenges and especially the last couple of months uh, through COVID, we were actually happy that we had the team in place um, to work our, through our project. Uh, let me just go find my mouse. Um, so we'll briefly talk about what the project scope was and then I'll hand over to Leek to talk about the project approach and then she'll hand back to me to talk about the team diversities and, and problems we faced and how we resolved them uh, with the team that we had. Um, so first of all, you see on the right here, we had a project deadline because there was going to be an FDA submission. And that's pretty much what we knew at the very beginning of the project. And we had, and I'll just let the slide build up a little bit. Um, when we started back in the first quarter of 2018, uh, we had one project manager on our side and at the bottom here we had one data manager on the customer side um, and that was pretty much all we we knew getting into it um, but by the quarter by end of quarter two uh, leak had also come on board and at the sponsor side there was also a new statistician and a data manager coming on for the support of legacy data conversion unfortunately as you, i don't know if you saw it but the data manager that was initially there left about the same time as that we put our team together. So while we were doing a legacy data conversion, there also was no legacy of uh, people at the sponsor side who had been part of any of the trials that were happening. So we kind of knew at, from project start that probably we were going to be in trouble, or at least it was going to be a very challenging uh, project. Um, as is good practice, we started with one pilot trial and the intent was that we would run through that pilot trial, run the lessons learned, and then uh, move on. But I guess the sponsor was quite happy with us because even before we finished the pilot trial, they piled on 15 more trials uh, onto our bucket. As you see, the deadlines did not shift, of course, uh, in that period. It actually got a little bit more challenging because by the end of the by a year, they added on two more trials. Luckily, at that point, the data manager who had left a year earlier came back. So we were really happy about that because we had lots of questions um, for him. Uh, and around the same time, another six trials were added and then two more trials were added. And before you think this is going to go way off, you see that I'm at the top of my page. So um, that's, what, that's the scope that we had. So by the end of quarter two, we had 21 trials, or no, 24 trials, and we had a deadline um, end of, March a year later. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lieke to talk about the project's goals, challenges and approaches. Yes, thank you, Jasmine. Um, well, as with all client projects and assignments, the main goal is to deliver on time, on budget and of course with the right quality. Um, well, the data had to be converted correctly and we had to be compliant with the CDIS standards, but as it involved the conversion of multiple trials, we also had to make sure that the conversion was done consistently across trials. So, for instance, we wanted to make sure that uh, category, categories that we were uh, assigning, that they were the same across trials. So it was really also important that we did this consistently. Well, as Jasmine uh, mentioned, the, uh, well, the scope increased, so we also had to scale up the team. That was also one of the goals actually during the whole project actually because the scope was increasing all over um, and well we onboarded junior staff with limited experience uh, and one other goal was really to keep the team motivated because it was a huge project with a lot of repetitive tasks uh, and yeah then it's really important to keep the team motivated that you really want to uh, continue uh, delivering a high quality and well the project also knows some challenges uh, well, first of all, we had to deal with a new client. Um, so, and as Jasmine mentioned, the discussion partner left in the beginning, so that was really challenging. Uh, but fortunately, he came back. Um, well, we also had to deal with a new team. As I mentioned, uh, well, we onboarded new staff. So we had to make sure that everyone within the team was aware of all the project conventions, um, all the decisions made, uh, that they were also implemented in uh, the other uh, studies. 
We also had to deal with some really complex data structures, and especially for the phase two trials, um, we actually just had one big flat data set containing all the variables. Uh, and well, as you can see on the screen, some data sets actually contained over 10,000 variables. So uh, really huge data sets uh, with poorly described metadata. So it was sometimes really challenging to figure out uh, what the data actually uh, contained, what it meant. Um, well, we also had to deal with uh, the data was collected actually by multiple uh, CROs. Um, so we really had to get familiar with, okay, what the, what is there within the data but luckily data that came from the same zero had a similar data structure so we could make use of that if we had seen it before then of course we could do the conversion more efficiently and um, then yes yeah, something about the project approaches that we took um so well the project actually consisted of two parts and the first part was that pilot uh, project so that what actually until the conversion of a phase two trial to SCTM and ADAM. And we also had to reproduce some tables. Um, that was more or less done as a QC activity to check whether the tables that we created based on the ADAM data sets were in line with the tables that were already part of the CSR that was created by the clients. Um, so that was really done as a QC activity. Um, what was really important that all the decisions made within this uh, Pilot project were also well, well had to be implemented in all subsequent trials. So we made a mapping convention document where we actually indicated like okay, or we also have more or less a library, um, like these values are the ones to be used, these are the decisions that were made. So um, just to make sure that we follow the rules also in the other uh, studies that had to be converted. Well, when we started with this project, the team just consisted of uh, three programmers, uh, one program with more than 50 years experience and two programmers with little to no experience. And well, this programmer with more than 15 years experience really uh, supported the programmers with little to no experience. And within this uh, pilot project, we took the approach to check, OK, um, each team member was responsible for certain domains. So he or she had the responsibility, for instance, for domains e uh, adverse events, vital signs, so both in the creation of SETM data sets for these domains, but also in the creation of the fine XML and also in the SCRG. So it was really domain uh, related and domain oriented. That is the approach that we took within this uh, pilot project. And then, well, the project continues, uh, as Jasmine said, uh, we had to convert 20 phase one trials we only had to convert them to SCTM, but we also had to convert an additional five uh, phase two trials. And again, we had to convert them to SCTM, Adam, and we had to reproduce tables for these. And this had to be done within a time frame of one year. Well, as the scope was increasing, we expanded the team and we expanded them with OCS Life Sciences X trainees. Um, but in OCS, we have a traineeship, a two month traineeship in which um, well, starters kick off their career more or less and they get acquainted with CDISC standards, they obtain a SAS base uh, and then they are assigned to a project. And well, we had uh, some OCS Life Science extremities within our team and we really noticed that, okay, learning by doing is the best way. And uh, they started with uh, QC activities, uh, but within a few months they were already able to do the mapping themselves. Uh, because, well, they got a lot of support from the other team members who were already longer within the team and they really felt, felt supported. But uh, it was really nice to see how easily they actually got into the team and really learned all the uh, mapping relating tasks. So uh, that was really nice. Um, well, after the pilot project, we evaluated uh, the project and we took a look, okay, which approach are we going to take within the second part of the project? Uh, and then we actually adjusted it. Uh, we thought because, well, we had a lot of career starters we, which are really eager uh, to learn. Uh, we thought it would be nice if a team member could just be responsible for a complete study rather than just for a few domains. Because if they were just responsible for a few domains, they had to do that for each study. Uh, and we thought like, okay, maybe that will become a little bit repetitive and maybe a bit boring. Um, and we thought, okay, we think we have a good team here. We think they are capable of just managing a complete study. So they actually had to annotate the CRF. They had to 
convert the data to SGTM, uh, created the finding smell, the SRG, the same for Adam, and they also had to create tables. And you could maybe argue that this is not the most efficient way of, uh, well, handling this uh, conversion, uh, but we think it was the best uh, decision ever because it really kept the team members motivated and they were really happy that they had a lot of variety within the work, but of course they also learned a lot because, well, it was just a full spectrum of uh, the conversion projects. Well, in every project, it's of course important that you do things efficiently and consistently, um, but especially in this project, which was, well, it was of course a long project, but we had to deliver quite a lot. So uh, we were really eager, like, okay, we need to do things efficiently and consistently. Uh, within OCS, we already had some tools available that would help us in ensuring that the things were done efficiently and consistently, but we also developed and or enhanced some tools. And this was mainly done by uh, based on team, uh, the team ID. So some team members had some IDs to develop things, and they were also developed by the team members. So that was really nice. And all those tools actually aim to reduce the repetitive number of tasks, and that uh, team members could focus on the data, which of course is the most important, but also more the nicest thing of a data conversion. I would now like to discuss some of these tools that we had in place or that we uh, developed during the conduct of this uh, project. Uh, the first one is this pre-analysis um, that you see in the slide. Uh, during the, so before we actually started the mapping, we did a pre-analysis of the studies. And we determined similarities between the studies in terms of um, study design, but also ACRF. So that was more or less like a manual inspection. Uh, but we also compared the received source data for the studies. So here you see um, an overview of this uh, pre-analysis report, and this is just displaying it for adverse events, but you can easily see which variables are available in source data set AE for the different studies. And for instance, you can see that variable uh, AE expect, so expected unexpected, was only available in two studies, um, but still it will help you in, when you want to map those studies, do you see, okay, how did we handle it in study three? We should do it the same way in study four. Um, and this report really helps us also in doing the resource allocation, because of course we want to do the things efficiently. So we assigned the same person to studies that were uh, similar. Um, and yeah, this also helped us in doing the, the conversion efficiently because we could make use of mappings that we did in another study already, and we could just make use of it in another study. And um, that really helped us in uh, making this project uh, efficient. Um, then our SETM data sets, when we really started with the mapping, uh, we created the SETM data sets using the mapping engine that was designed and developed by OCS Life Sciences. And this mapping engine converts actually the source data to output data. Um, and the only input that it needs besides, of course, the source data are the mapping specifications. And the mapping specifications actually contain just one. Uh, no problem. Oh, yeah, you can go to the next one. That's fine. Uh, yes. So here you actually see this uh, an example of that uh, Excel spreadsheet. So the mapping specification file. And this is the only thing that the mapping engine needs. So the mapping engine itself actually consists of a set of SETH programs that ensures that this mapping specification file is being read and also uh, interpreted correctly. Um, but as a user, you only need to populate this Excel sheet. And if you go through the uh, Excel sheets, you see on the left side, the source data sets and source variables. So all source data sets and source variables that are um, uh, applicable to your study should be part of this Excel sheet. Then you see your target DS and target variables. So, okay, which source variables should be mapped to which target variable. Then there's just a human readable specification. So this doesn't really have a functionality, but just as a user and also as a validator, you want to see, okay, how were these target variables derived? And then in the right column, in the function column, there's actually the pseudocode, how we call it, uh, that the mapping engine needs to perform the actual conversion. So 
we just have some codes available, some functions available in which the uh, by which the mapping engine knows, okay, this is how I need to convert data. So, for instance, if we take an example and we take a look at AE spits, um, then you see that the function is just copy, which means that the source variable is directly being copied to AE spits. Uh, but you also see that there's a where statement, so only certain records should be selected. So it's just um, really easy to map the data because, well, it doesn't need that much SAS program. It just needs, um, well, simple codes. And of course, we can also add SAS program, um, so SAS code over here in this function code, but um, it's really user friendly actually to map the data in such a way. Um, well, at the right bottom, you also see a recoding list that we could apply. So we also had a function recodes. So if we had to recode source values um, one through three, then we recoded them to miles, moderate and severe. And therefore we had this function recode in place. And well, as I mentioned within this project, we use the mapping engine to convert the data to SCTM. And the team members really thought it was really easy to learn and to use. It's really a user-friendly tool. And as it is Excel-based, it's really easy to well, select and to filter certain mappings. And that is really helpful in reusing those mappings in other studies that are really comparable. So that makes, again, the uh, conversion really efficiently, but also consistently, because if you can make use of previous mappings, well, there will be less uh, inconsistencies. Then after the mappings, we actually created a data steward report. And this data steward report is an overview of all the SCTM data sets and Atom data sets that we created. And then within each data set, the variable names, the variable labels, types, and values, so really attributes. And this was really to check whether the mapping was done consistently, so that whether the same values were assigned, for instance, to LB cats. Well, as you can see in this example, in LBCATS, uh, two values were used, drug test and drug testing. And in study two, the value drug testing was assigned. Well, as you can imagine, this is an inconsistent C, and that's something that we wanted to fix. So this data suit report really uh, gives you insight in which values have been assigned and was it done consistently. But at some point, we also started using this actually as a library because yeah, it gives you all the information, it gives you all the values that were assigned in previous studies, so you can easily look it, look up, like, okay, which uh, value, for instance, for LBCATS should be I assigned if drug tests were uh, done. Then um, the last tool that I want to mention is the Defining XML tool that we created. Um, well, when we started this project, so during the pilot project, we used uh, Pinnacle 21 tool to create the fine XML, which of course is a really nice tool to support you in the creation of the fine XML, but it only provides you some metadata on data set level and variable level, and it still requires you to input a lot of things manually. So here you can see an overview and well, we for instance had to uh, assign the origin ourselves and also the CRF pages. But then during the project, we thought of hmm, maybe we can automate some parts of this defining XML. And this was actually the idea of two team members, and they really were really eager to develop uh, such a tool. Um, so well, we allowed them to develop it, and they come up came up with a program to both create and to validate the defining XML. And as you can see in this uh, slide and in this overview already a lot of uh, items were filled out. So even the uh, annotations on which page they were collected uh, on the CRF was already uh, populated. And that's really helped a lot in uh, reducing the time that we needed for the development and validation of a defining XML. Uh, but again, also really important is that it really kept the team motivated that they were allowed to think about tools that we could develop or enhance uh, and well, the things that we didn't have to do anymore were the tedious, repetitive tasks. Um, so they were really happy that we now had a tool in place to support us in that. Um, yes, and then I would like to hand over to Jasmine. Yes, she's going to talk about team diversity. Yes, yes. So indeed, at the team, it was a relative young team, and initially we were um, not concerned 
actually quite excited about having a team in. Um, but because they weren't vastly experienced in clinical development, we thought, you know, let's make the most of what they still know from uh, coming back. So with the team, we had um, just one data manager and two real expert technical SaaS programmers. And then the vast majority of the team were in fact clinical programmers doing the conversion. Um, but we also made use of their language skills, which you will see in a little bit. And we also made a lot of use from, you know, what was their background, uh, when was it, you know, more the uh, technology driven or when was it really about the content of the data? Because as you uh, probably realize, when you do legacy data conversion, sometimes it's science and sometimes it's a little bit more of an art in trying to understand what the data meant, especially if it wasn't always uh, well described. So I'll um, just give you one example of uh, using the team diversity for uh, problem resolution. Right? So the ch data challenge that we had is that the data did come from multiple CROs and some of the data was quite old, coming back from 2006 to, to now. Um, there were a lot of source issues is that, and sometimes there was no metadata described, sometimes it was, and a lot of the documents were not in English. Um, so, an example of that is we had a, a data set like this. It's called Cal, it's a SAS data set, of course. Uh, it did not have, so it had all these variables, but there were no labels with the variables and there were no units. Uh, we could not find anything back in the SAP. We, we found uh, a short reference to, and we'll see in a little bit in the protocol, but also not in the CSR, but still the data was there. Um, so we realized from the protocol that uh, it had, it probably had to do with calorimetry yeah, because the data set was cal, and we did see in the protocol that there was such a thing as calorimetry. Um, so that's where we started. I said, what, what if this is a calorimetry um, data set? What are the typical measurements that we would find there? And so we went digging into um, literature to see, okay, what are the typical results? And then you see here, do you have direct and indirect calorimetry and uh, energy expenditure? And we looked at some graphs and we said, ah, yes, there's glucose, there's oxidated glucose, there's non-oxidated glucose. So we were trying to put, uh, we saw a few things that seemed started to make sense to us. Then, um, so uh, that was the second part of what we had. Then we still had a few measurements. If you go back to the, if I go back to the pre uh, previous one, so we were now able to find out the carbon dioxide and the oxygen with the glucose and lipids and proteins and, and nitrogen, but we still had two variables that we had no idea uh, what they were. At least we weren't able to find them just yet. So these were the ones that we linked. We did more literature research and we said, ah, yes, there's a few more uh, variables that are very typical of calorimetry. What does this mean? Next step that we did was really very simple. We used our language skills and we said, okay, from the previous page, we saw that there was such a thing as energy expenditure. And what happens in France is in French, and excuse me for the French that are here, usually you switch your words around. So we figured that's probably what happened. The words were switched, uh, switched around. So energy expenditure became Dupin's energy and the N, uh, NPRQ, was QRNP in French. Of course, we didn't just say, okay, great, we got it like that. We did validate and like see, see if all these uh, results made sense. We recalculated them. But you do see that we, um, so I'm going to go back one more, that we had to use a, a diversity of skills, both technical and content and language um, to be able to, to fix the legacy data conversion. And then the team diversity really helped us become a success. With that, I'm going to hand over back to Lieke to talk about the final steps in the project. Lieke? Yes, so, well, the current status is actually that it, the project has been delivered. It has been delivered on time and also with high quality, and that has been confirmed by an independent reviewer. Um, well, we plan to celebrate actually in April, but yeah, because of the COVID outbreak, we had to postpone, but we will definitely celebrate soon because it was really a successful uh, project. Um, yes, and if we then go to our conclusion, I would like to share some just some key learnings uh, that we had during the conduct of this project. 
Uh, well, we've really seen that motivation is the key to success. And therefore, it's, it's really important to keep your team motivated and to really involve them in project decisions. Uh, and really know, and but also more important, accept that there's no one approach to doing it right. Please involve your team and uh, let them come up with uh, some ideas and suggestions. And well, what really helped us was that we really had uh, well, the availability, or well, we allowed the team members to uh, create tools uh, that reduce the repetitive task, and that they could really focus on what is most important, and also the thing that they really liked, which is the data, so that they could really puzzle with the data and ensure that the conversion was done uh, con correctly. Well, and having said this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, we are more than happy to answer any questions.